In Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, we encounter the reality that the gospel story has the power to transform every single aspect of our story. And that's exactly what we were made for. This is Ephesians, and we're Mercy Village Church in Barbersville, West Virginia. And you can learn more at www.mercyvillage.church. Back in 1963, which really isn't that long ago, if you think about it, Martin Luther King was being interviewed, and he said these words. He said, It's appalling that the most segregated hour in Christian America is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. It's appalling that the most segregated hour in Christian America is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. He'd be murdered five years later after that. And 50 years later, roughly, Pew Research would, would do a survey of local congregations across the United States of America and find that even 50 years later, still 80% of churches today are monolithic. They include one ethnicity in them. We're one today. It's my daughter's birthday, so she didn't come. We're monolithic today. It is, at some level, what it is. It's not a condemnation, but it is to bring an awareness to this reality that ethnically there are divisions that have existed in our history, very strong divisions that have existed in our country. But it's not just ethnic divisions. This passage today speaks primarily to ethnic division, but it's applicable down to all the things that divide us. And there are many things that divide us. I I believe this statement, that the digital age has made a wider group of people than ever before more frequently confronted and more frequently and distinctly aware of what divides us. That's what the digital age has done for us. It's not the only thing. There's good things too, but, but it has made us very aware of what, of what divides us. What I would love to do when I read this list to kind of prove my point is if I could have a blood pressure cuff on every single one of us as I read this list of topics. Because there is a visceral response in all of us to at least some of these things on here. Just get a load of this list. When I say these things, how how does your heart respond? Trump 2024, right? That means something to almost everyone in this room. Black Lives Matter, defund the police, white supremacy, don't tread on me, taxation is theft. How about Sean Hannity? Any response to him or Rachel Maddow? The gender wage gap, income Inequality, Me Too, Movement, Believe, Women, Separation of Church and State, Religious Freedom, Animal Rights. How about gender-neutral bathrooms? How do you feel about that? Or abortion, transgender rights, cancel culture, gun control, gay marriage, global climate change, immigration, fossil fuels, right? Oh, whoo, that's a lot. And we're aware of how divided we are about those things. Narcan, vaccines, legalization of marijuana, mask mandates, Wuhan, China, right? That does something to all of us. Probably different things to many of us. What about these names? Joe Biden, Joe Manchin, Joe Rogan, Joe Mama. (laughs) It's impossible to resist that one. We love to divide, and we are more aware than ever about the things that divide us. Even stupid things divide us. Uh, Marshall or WVU. Have you, I mean, like intensely divides people. I'm one of them, right? That's like in, intensely, viscerally responsive to that. Divides. That's just the way we are. Rams or Bengals might be another one, right? Hopefully we're not as divided here. Hopefully we all know who God's cheering for tonight, the Bengals, but I was joking. (laughs) 
We're divided, man. We are people who divide. And we're fully aware of, of what it is that divides us. In the church at Ephesus, would have been in the exact same place, fully aware of what divides people. And it would have been more than ethnicity for them, but at the top of their list would have been ethnicity at this time when the church, the people of God, were merging, was the merging together of ethnic Jews and, and people who were not of the Jewish ethnicity. We saw this last week in verse 11. When Paul says, therefore, remember to the church at Ephesus, which have mainly been Gentiles, people who were not Jewish. Remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made by hands, made by the flesh of hands. This was an ethnic division that existed. See, more than any other culture or ethnicity, And we'll get into this more here in just a second. The Jews had a practice. They had several practices. Circumcision, dietary restrictions, the way that they observed the Sabbath. And these were of deep value to them. And the rest of society around them didn't practice that combination of things at the same uh, emphatic nature that they did. And so there was this division that was very clearly seen between ethnic Jews and and non-ethnic Jews. Jews and into that wall of ethnic division that existed within the church and by proxy into the wall of all other divisions, even the ones that we listed just now, comes the wrecking ball of the reconciler Jesus crashing into those divisions and showing that Jesus, that's what I want you to get today, Jesus is the singular hope of togetherness in our world of countless divisions because you can only have reconciliation with the reconciler. Jesus is the singular hope of togetherness in our world of countless divisions because you can only have reconciliation with the reconciler. That's what I want us to see today. Father, what we know not, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us. It's the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Last week, we saw that we have been reconciled to God. That's vertical. That in His great love for us, even though we were distant, far off, dead in our trespasses and sins, aliens, and and, uh, with no hope, that God gave His Son Jesus, the Reconciler. And Jesus gave His life on the cross, giving His blood and the blood of Jesus Christ God's Son cleanses us from all sin, making it possible for us to be in a relationship with God, reconciled to God. And we went there first because our relationship with God, we have to understand our reconciliation to God before we ever can understand our reconciliation to one another. But that vertical reconciliation must then spill out in a horizontal reconciliation with each other. And this need was obvious in Ephesus. The division would have been absolutely distinctly understood between the circumcision and the uncircumcision. Those were nicknames that they would have given to each other. So prolific was that practice among the Jewish people that that would have been what they were called, the circumcision. There may have been other folks who practiced that religiously in certain maybe sectors of a ethnicity, maybe certain parts of a culture, but holistically, as an entire ethnic group, nobody else practiced it as prolifically as the Jews. That was what they were known for, and therefore that became their nickname, the circumcision. What a great nickname uh, to have. But they then, spitefully, would call everyone who was not an ethnic Jew the uncircumcision. So clearly there's a division here. Paul says that this was a division that was external. Circumcision is an external thing. It's it's an external behavior. There would have been other behaviors that the ethnic Jews would have had too. These external things that divide. Most of what divides us is external. The division was traditional, handed down from Abraham through their fathers, right? Passed down, right? My grandpa believed it. My great-grandpa believed it. My great-great-great-grandpa believed it. Passed down through. And it had become, this division had become just a human construct. It wasn't originally. God had given circumcision as a sign to His people. 
of his relationship with them. But now, after the cross, if you go to Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, you see what God did through Jesus. He says, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly. Being Jewish, is being the people of God is no longer an external thing, nor is circumcision outward and physical. Because Jesus died on the cross, this is what had happened. A Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. The point is this. When Jesus died on the cross, those practices from the past of circumcision, dietary restrictions, strict observation of the Sabbath were no longer requirements to be in a relationship with God, to be near to God. And so because of that, there was no longer a need to hold up those as places to divide. But you combine all those things together, okay? And you think about what's traditionally held in in a culture. We hold to that tightly. You think about the things that externally identify us. We will hold to those things tightly. Especially if we feel like we're the ones that have to hold them up. And so this division among the, it's hard, especially in a monolithic church, to convey the weight that would have, of this division that would have existed between these folks. This would have been like the Jim Crow South. It would have been so obvious. They would not have ate together. They would not have drank after each other. They would not have worked together. Complete division. Looking down on one another. And in the church, right, the Gentiles at first would have been the minority. Those who came into the church from outside of of ethnic Judaism would have been the minority at first and looked down upon there. And so this is a real division, a, a very obvious division. And there's seemingly no hope of togetherness for them. No hope of togetherness in this world of countless divisions because you can only have reconciliation with the reconciler, but that's where Jesus comes in. Verse 14. We're going to see the unit or the end of hostility in verses 14 and 15, but he himself, Jesus, is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. Broken down and abolished are kind of those headliner words. They're big time. But underneath them is who is doing the breaking down, who is doing the abolishing. That's what matters. It's Jesus. He himself, Jesus, is the one. The, the reconciler is the one who brings reconciliation. The one who reconciles us to God reconciles us to one another. That has to be uh, understood. Or there really is no hope of true reconciliation outside of Jesus. There will be variations of it in this world. You'll see unity amongst people. You'll see pushes for unity, but true, lasting, eternal, transformative, holistic reconciliation amongst people can only come through Jesus Christ. He himself, the reconciler, and he brings peace with him. That reconciliation comes with peace. There was this saying in Rome, it was, it was Pax Romana, which meant peace through Rome, which what they were saying was, if we rule over you, right, if we come in and take over your land, then we will bring peace to your plate, right? But they brought it with the sword. They brought it with power. They brought it with, with uh, the, an iron fist. That They couldn't bring real peace. You can't have peace without the prince of peace. You can't have reconciliation without the reconciler. You can't have the kingdom without the king. And so into these divisions comes Jesus, breaking down the wall of hostility and abolishing the law and command. We already talked about it, but just to be explicit, what this meant here is that before Jesus, the only way to be near to God was to obey the commands of the Torah. First five books of your Bible. Those laws written in there, including circumcision and dietary restrictions and Sabbath Sabbath restrictions in particular. Without obeying those 
rules, you couldn't be near to God. That was the only way to be there. But now, there's a new and better covenant. Okay? Here's what happens. Galatians 3. We were in Galatians a while back. Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 through 25. Say this. Now, before faith came, in other words, before Jesus died on the cross, we were held captive under the law. It was our only way to be near God. We had to obey the rules or we couldn't be near God. Imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. No longer justified by the law, now justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the guardian. That's what uh, Paul means when he says the law has been abolished. He doesn't mean that it's irrelevant to us anymore. It doesn't mean there's not stuff that we learn from the law. And he certainly doesn't mean that its original purpose is no longer fulfilled. Because the original purpose of the law, we saw this in Galatians 2, was to reveal to us our need for a Savior. That was always God's purpose for the law, was to reveal to us how much we needed Jesus. And so people before Jesus would obey the law in faith that there would one day be a Messiah to come. It was faith that saved them, but their faith was manifest through the keeping of the law. Now that faith is manifest in believing that what Jesus accomplished on the cross was enough to make us right with God. And in that, right, the law as a way to be brought near to God was abolished. And with that should have been abolished the hostility that existed between the Jews and the Gentiles. But they hadn't got there yet. They still were there. But in reality, right, they were living in an alternate reality. Their conflict existed in an alternate reality because the true reality was that that wall had been broken down. They were still living like a wall was there, but it wasn't. Jesus had ended that. And so any false pretense that you or I or the Jews or the Gentiles had of superiority dies at the cross. Every bit of it. You're not worthy of being reconciled to God in and of yourself. I'm not worthy of being reconciled to God in and of myself. The Jews weren't worthy of being reconciled to God in and of themselves. Neither were the Gentiles. We're all on the same plane. No one's better than the other, except for Jesus, who's better than all of us and does what we can't do. Makes it possible for us to be reconciled to God and to each other. And with that comes unity, verses, the end of verse 15 and verse 16. That he might create in himself one new man in place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through uh, the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Two expressions of unity here. One is a new man. Uh, Kinos anthropos is the Greek. You know, I'm butchering it, but it means a new, never before existing person, right? Like that's what that means. It's not like two people are brought together forming one new man, although that is, it's two people are completely made new by Jesus and are then brought together into a new man. One body, the word soma is in there. There's a, there's a, a, a group of churches in, in Indiana called Soma Churches, and that comes from the word body. We're the body of Christ, one body. And so this is who we are now, one body, one new man. That's the reality. We don't act like that. We don't always live like that, but that's who we are. Now, the point here isn't a monolith, by the way. That's not why what God, that's not reconciliation. Reconciliation is not to create this group of people who all act the same, look the same, and do the same thing. No, it's to bring together a wide range of people from every walk of life, every experience, every type of background into this melting pot that becomes a billboard for God's grace. Matt Chandler says it like this. He says, God gathers up the full range of the world's ethnic diversity, every tribe, tongue, and nation. This is beautiful. In the same way that God doesn't destroy material stuff when he makes all things new. In the end, when when God makes all things new, he doesn't destroy everything, he transforms it. He doesn't destroy the people either. So various ethnicities are not a problem to be solved, 
but rather there's something in it that shows the beauty of God's creative being. There's something there that God says, this is a part of all things being made new, that no one ethnicity, no one culture can bear the brunt, can bear the weight of the breath and beauty of the creator God of the universe. And so the point is this. Your culture doesn't get erased when you come into the body of Christ. Your ethnicity doesn't get erased when you come into the body of Christ. Your experiences, your background, right? You don't cease to be Appalachian when you come into the body of Christ. You don't cease to be a black man when you come into the body of Christ. Those things still testify to countless things about you, but in the melting pot of those beautiful diversity together, outrageous diversity, there is an outrageous proclamation of God's beauty and of His grace. We become billboards of His grace. And so hostility is destroyed, unity is brought, and with that also comes peace. Verses 17 and 18. And He came, Jesus, and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through Him we both have access in one Spirit to the Father. Notice verse 18. I love these verses. They have the Trinity when they, the Trinity is in one verse and He's there. For through Him, Jesus, we both have access in one Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, to the Father. God the Spirit, God the Father, God the Son. All there in verse 18. That's just a free observation. But peace comes when Jesus preaches it to us. He brings shalom. That's the Hebrew word that then gets translated into this Greek. But the concept is total, holistic, complete peace for everyone. That shalom is brought regardless of position. Those who are near get peace. Those who are far off get peace. Watch this parable from Luke. I love this one. It's the highways and the byways parable. This is Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 16. But he said to him, Jesus is telling a parable, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. And then the next few verses flesh out what those excuses were. But you go to verse 21, everyone has ref- that's been invited has refused to come. So what does the banquet host decide to do? So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you have commanded has been done and there's still room. And the master said to the servant, go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be full. Listen to me. We're the highways and the byways people. We're not the ones who were near in this example. The ones who were near were the Jews. The ones who had known God and walked with God from uh, out of Egypt through the Red Sea, wandered in the wilderness, been brought into the promised land with power. They were the ones who were near. They sat in the knowledge of God for thousands of years. When Jesus came, they started to say, many, many of them would say, this is not the Messiah. In the kingdom, the doors to the kingdom, like never before, the kingdom of God's always been for everyone, but in this, in this super visible way, in this undeniable way, the doors to the kingdom get thrown open to you and me, the Gentiles. Not Jews ethnically, the outcast, the uncircumcision, the crippled, the blind, and the lame, the highway and the byway dwellers, us, brought into the kingdom. Don't forget who you are. Come back to this. Sentence. Don't forget who you are. Or you, if you want to be reconciled to other people, if you want to be hospitable to other people, you better remember that you were on the highways and the byways when Jesus found you. That you and me were the crippled and the lame and the broken when, when God finds us. It's the only way that will truly. And that peace is brought to all who are far and all who are near. And lastly, it's, it's an identity. This reconciliation changes 
our identity. Verse 19 says this, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. We talked about being members of the household of God last week. That we, the children of God, the, the church, are living stones being built together in a dwelling place for God. He wants to be near to us. But the point that he's making here is that those living stones are the most diverse, hodgepodge, random bunch of stones that you've ever seen in your life. From every tribe and tongue and nation, from every background, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female, together being built into the dwelling place of the Lord. And our identity has changed. From aliens to citizens. That's the vertical change. We were illegal aliens, now citizens of the kingdom vertically. You know what that means horizontally? Don't keep people out. Right? Don't keep people out of the kingdom. Think about it in a church context, right? Like none of us are ever going to be like, nope, get out of here when someone walks in the door. But man, if we know a little bit about them, maybe, right? Like when they kind of walk in, we might turn our shoulder, okay? And in that way, right, we're not explicitly keeping people out, but we're turning away from people and in, and in a sense, keeping them out. People who were aliens, who are now citizens, shouldn't behave that way. They should remember that they themselves were once unwelcomed, and now they've been welcomed. We've been changed from sinners into saints. That's vertical. Horizontally, that means we should forgive others. There should be forgiveness that spills out of our hearts for others. Who's forgiven more than God himself? Forgiving me, forgiving you. So we should be marked by forgiveness. Our identity is that. And we've changed from strangers into household members And that means we should throw wide our arms and welcome others in the name of Jesus. And this identity, this identity is shared. I've read this quote once before. I'll read it again because it just just hits exactly what this point is. This is Mark Dever and Jamie Dunlop. We read this book as a core team early 2021. Some of us did. And he says this about this reconciled community of people being brought together and how beautiful it is and how it displays the glory of God. He says, consider a group of Jews and Gentiles who share nothing in common except for a centuries-old loathing for one another. For a less extreme modern-day parallel, think of liberal Democrats and libertarian Republicans in, in my own neighborhood. Or the disdain the Prada shod fashionista feels for the Schlitz swilling, which is a beer-chugging NASCAR crowd. And then multiply that many times over, of course. Think about the differences that we read on that list that exist. Bring those people together in the local church where they rub shoulders on a regular basis and things explode, right? You got Republicans and Democrats, things are going to explode, right? You got people who vote one way or feel one way about a certain issue and and other people who feel a different way about a certain issue is going to explode. No, because of the one thing they have in common the bond of Christ. They live together in astonishing love and unity, unity that is so unexpected, so contrary to how the world operates, that even the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, we'll get to that when we get to chapter 3, sit up and take notice. God's plans are amazing, aren't they? Yes, they are. That's the vision for Mercy Village Church. That's the vision for for the people of God, that we would be so utterly diverse and different, yet so unified in Christ that when the world looks at us, they say, that is different. That doesn't look like anything else the world offers. That is so distinctly different. And the only way that happens is Jesus. And these verses, we've kind of split up into two weeks and sandwiched together, about eight, nine verses here. We've seen in Christ Jesus... By the blood of Christ, he himself, Jesus himself, Jesus came through Jesus, Christ Jesus himself, in Jesus, in Jesus, in Jesus, in Jesus. It's unequivocal that the only way this happens is in Jesus. And that's good news for Christians because we struggle to pull it off in our own power. 
we need Jesus' help. But it's good news today, too, if you're not a Christian, because this reconciliation can be for you. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 through 21. They, therefore, we, the church, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. If you're not a Christian today, this is what's happening right now. God is making an appeal to you through these knuckleheads here. An appeal, and the appeal is this We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And the way that that's possible is verse 21. For our sake, he made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, that, we, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. To reconcile you to himself, God made his son to be regarded as a sinner, even though Jesus was perfect. And there on the cross, God poured out his wrath and punishment on sin on Jesus. Jesus drank every last drop of that wrath on your behalf. He was dead, buried, and raised from the dead. And if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be reconciled to God today. If you are a Christian, let's be reconciled to one another. Here's the practical call of today's sermon. Two two parts. One, remember the distance that once was, and two, experience and embody the nearness that now is. So the first is humbling. we got to be humble people. We have to remember the distance that once was. As you scroll your social media feed and you have the urge to get up on your high horse and be frustrated with the people in your life, remember the distance that once was. That you once were far off from God. You once, right, and sometimes still are, in my case, a knucklehead saved by grace. Remember that as you scroll, as you sit with your family at Thanksgiving dinner and there's opinions that frustrate you. Remember the distance that once was this week as you engage with your spouse and they, right, frustrate you. Remember the distance that once was as you engage your kids, as you engage your neighbors, as you watch the news and read the headlines. As you struggle to forgive that person in your life who, yes, they've wronged you, but now they're seeking reconciliation and and seeking to your forgiveness. And you struggle to do it, and then I get it. Remember the distance that once was. As you hear gossip this week, right? And you feel the desire to spread that gossip on, right? Because that's what gossip's for, right? What good is gossip if we don't get to share it ourselves, right? Remember the distance that once was, you uncircumcised swine, right? Like, like that's who we were, right? And you're going to go and gossip about so-and-so's behaviors on the weekend or something? Come on, right? Like, it just doesn't fit. I'm guilty, too. It doesn't fit. Remember the distance that once was. And then, two, experience and embody the nearness that now is. The first humbles us. The other one brings us close. First, you got to experience it. You didn't bring yourself close to God. God did that for you. There's two ways that we fail to experience it. One, on one side, we can become entitled to it. We somehow think that our nearness to God is because we're something special. It's not. In that, we then become uh, cocky people who don't extend that same grace to others. So don't grow entitled, but also don't grow forgetful. Some of you today feel unworthy. You feel shame. You feel pushed away from God. But both of these are false narratives. If you think God saved you because you're special, that's a false narrative. If you think God saved you, but he kind of keeps you at arm's length because you still have so many problems, that is also a false narrative. You have been brought near to God by grace through faith. And so the cross of Jesus speaks a better word into our lives. So hear Jesus speak this week. The spiritual disciplines of this life are for us. That's why we read our Bibles. That's why we uh, pray. That's why we engage in the different spiritual disciplines that the Bible calls us to. And then lastly, embody it. Might we, Mercy Village Church, be a church that moves towards those who we would be tempted to call others? They're different than us. They act different, look different. 
than us. All people should feel welcome in this place. Forgiveness should be rampant in this place. Unity, peace, living from our new identity should mark us here in this place. My friend Doug Logan, he's a pastor, gives this illustration of gumbo. He talks about gumbo. I don't know if you've ever had gumbo. It's from the south, primarily Louisiana. It's kind of where you can find gumbo. You ever go to New Orleans, you can get gumbo. The truth about gumbo is, is nobody really knows what's in gumbo. Because real gumbo is never the same. It's not. It's different every time. It's got some of that in it. Sometimes it has some of this in it. And sometimes it has some of this and some of that in it. And sometimes it has other stuff in it. And on paper, if you looked at the recipe for gumbo, you'd be like, that doesn't go together. That doesn't look right. What? This this is what we're going to eat? Are you serious? But you put it all in the pot. Diverse group of ingredients. And it simmers for hours and hours and hours. And then you eat it. And when you eat it, that diverse, those diverse flavors all melded together as you eat them, you turn to the chef and you salute and say, yeah. Now I see what you were doing. In the church, Mercy Village Church is called to be gospel gumbo. A group of people so wildly diverse that on paper it just doesn't look like it would ever work. Simmering together in, our, in a, the, the, the church life of the church. And then when other people come in, They taste and see that the Lord, the chef, is good. Might we be gospel gumbo, right? Might we be a body of people, although widely diverse, and may we grow more diverse, not just ethnically, but in all areas of division, with such love for one another, such dedication to one another, such a commitment to moving towards one another that, People look at the church and they taste and see that the Lord is good. That can only happen, right? You can't have reconciliation without the reconciler. But the reconciler, Jesus is the head of the church and Jesus is the singular hope of togetherness in our world of countless divisions. Let's pray. Father, you're so kind to have reconciled us to yourself. Might we be kind to reconcile to one another. If there's people in this room right now struggling to forgive, and again, may it, that be done in a safe way, not, a, not an unsafe way, but might people in this room have the power to forgive. If there's relationships that are struggling in this place, might, might those relationships be healed? If there's any sort of um, biases that we're hanging on to, in our lives. May those be let go in this place. And might we be a church that when people walk in, they see right off the bat that all are welcome here because of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening. You can subscribe to this feed wherever you listen to podcasts. We exist to experience and embody redemption and renewal in Christ alone. And we'd love for you to experience what God is doing as Jesus builds Mercy Village Church. Connect with us online at www.mercyvillage.church.